Live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Speak Up Monday here from Tropical Nomad. Every Monday at 6 30. My name is Robert Ian Bonick, the tourism architect. And tonight, my guest, another brother called Rob, is, uh, is a phenomenal guy. I mean, we met through a mutual friend, uh, a mutual brother, Gil Petersall. So, Gil, if you're watching this, Gil Petersall is like a networking, masterminding genius who has one of the best networks in the world and is a beautiful human being. And, and Rob, you know, like the Buddha of investing. I can't wait to ask that question. The Buddha of investing. 28 years, you know, you know, running companies. Uh, 18 years as an angel investor. You know, you were a Thai boxing champion. You know, you've <laughs> you've created this incredible blockchain project that's transforming the world. You know, like you are an incredible human being, Rob Charles, and I've only known you for less than like 48 hours. <laughs> a little bit longer. A little bit longer, maybe 72, pushing it. So everybody, uh, we'll do this on camera now. A warm round of applause to Rob Charles, please. That was warm, that was, I felt that, that was good. Ooh, before they were so bad. All right. <laughs> so Rob, uh, the first question that, that lands in my mind, you know, like the Buddha of investing, that's a pretty bold statement. And you know, what I intuit from Buddha is this wisdom, uh, this centeredness, uh, this ability to be able to ride the storm and remain calm and all the rest of that. But if I ask you, you know, Buddha of investing, what does that mean to you and how did that come about? So uh, first off, thank you, and, um, and thank you everyone for having me here today, um, welcoming me, wel welcoming us and our team to uh, Bali, um, which is amazing. Um, so first off, the boot of investing, um, my first ayahuasca ceremony was in December 22nd, um, 2021, um, when everything moved from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. And um, in my first ceremony, I was downloaded of, uh, gifted numerous things and one of them was um, that I should go by the boot of investing. Got it. That was the first thing. Got it. And so some people here are probably wondering, you know, we know about a little bit about Goldfinger, but you know what, actually for those who don't, um, can you describe uh, your Goldfinger project? So Goldfinger, we're the first digital uh, investment club. We started in 2014 um, with the first also conscious network uh, with 11 uh, principles into a global, um, what I call a mastermind network. Uh, we have um, over 100,000 angels, VCs, funds, family offices, top projects, top innovators um, in this global system, uh, in our global network. <clears throat> the original concept happened uh, in 2001 um, before social networks existed. I called it a mastermind matrix at the time. And it was an um, idea of how I could connect some guys I grew up with together and how we could stay connected. And um, we were doing deals and stuff together back then, what, 21 years ago. And I had an idea, how could I fractionalize all the energy that's coming through me and, and make uh, basically a little bit of a lot coming through that was coming through me and how to monetize my network. That was the original concept. And then uh, it started evolving, went from a men's organization to a women's organization. Uh, but it's basically the same premise, um, this deal system slash so social network. And I think most importantly is our why um, in order for global change to happen, um, which is very complex. We're looking at very, very complex problems now, uh, even more so with COVID, especially with the unraveling of different systems and different paradigms is key we have to connect the power structures working together collectively and when i say power structures i mean the the decision makers um people with capital not just not just real real capital but intellectual human and real capital that's when i how we define capital which is now through the community um, and accessing and um, but we've already seen what's happened uh, during the pandemic like with GameStop basically communities um, GameStop community would have basically crashed the entire financial system if, um, uh, if the w regulators didn't step in uh, and collectively and this has been going on the mastermind principles have been going on for centuries I didn't invent it um, every major fortune every major uh, successful person uh, has had a mastermind group um, people that they work with, they collectively come up with a, a collective consciousness, which is greater than the sum of its parts. 
And so through the years, I took different things and said, how can I combine these? Um, because to me, the current systems have, have been inefficient for some time. And how can we work collectively together to share resources and help um, fuel uh, and fund and scale these different projects that are changing the world? Um, you know, and like you mentioned before about the why. So I want to ask you that question, why, but there's two parts to it, right? So, you know, why are you doing this project is the first part of it. And the second part of it is why you? And you can say that however you want. It could be like, why me? What makes you qualify to do it if I want to use that? But whatever's coming up for you. So two-pronged question. Why did the Goldfinger project come up? And then why are you doing it? Why are you the best person to, to actually do it, make it happen? So great question. So first off, um, <coughs> why the Goldfinger project? Like I said, um, I had the concept, original idea, 21 years ago. Um, honestly, at the time, I, wasn't, I didn't have the expertise or the experience to pull it off, but it kept evolving. And, um, and while I was living in New York in 2000, I moved to New York in 2000, the first tech bubble. Um, and when that crashed, I started doing what most people do. Uh, that age in New York, um, chasing money and started investing in cannabis and making a lot of money and all these things I thought that mattered. So uh, you were investing in cannabis? Uh, in 2003, I started investing in cannabis, yeah. I started investing as an angel in 2003, originally in cannabis and real estate. It was the first things uh, I invested in. And so I was chasing money and I was doing a lot of things I thought that mattered. And then 2009, the subprime crisis crashed and, and within, I spent years and years of building my real estate portfolio and, and read hundreds of books and was self-taught and then within months, you know, the real estate crashed. And um, so I went through a life change and I moved to Asia, moved to Taiwan in 2010 and I went back to my original concept. Um, I said, why isn't there anyone doing what um, this concept, why? why? Mm -hmm. And um, went back to it and kept evolving it. And then I came back to New York in 2014 to, to get it off the ground. Um, so it's my life work. It's what I'm uh, working on. I've been working on for basically 21 years, um, eight years in business. Um, we'll continue working on this uh, in some capacity um, for the rest of my life, yeah. Got it, man. And so th the next which comes up for me is, which qualities do you possess, right? You mentioned that you had this whole portfolio. Now, the people here probably, damn, a lot of people. <laughs> you, you, know, you know, when we dreamed up this idea of Speak Up Monday, and I'm going to get teary in a minute, it was seeing exactly what I'm seeing now, like 50, 60, 80 people, whatever the amount is, but in the garden you know, just being inspired and motivated by what was happening. So, wow, Whew, I feel, Whew. okay. So, so Rob, so which qualities, because people might be here thinking, I've done it, I've lost it, I'm in the dumps. I don't know what to do, I don't know how to get it back. There might be some people here saying, I'm going through it, right? It's been two years of hell for some people and they've done it, they've lost it and they're trying to work their way up. So then the question is, you know, like, what or which qualities did you have that you think contributed to the success that you now have, being that you went down and you lost a lot? Yeah, well, a great question. I've lost a lot many times. Um, I've had it and lost it many times over. Um, say the number, if you were just say one, I'd say tenacity. Yeah. So just never give up. Yeah. And tenacity, right? So you're quite unusual, right? I've got two guys here. I mentioned them again. We've got Andre and, and Alex, and these guys are they're, they're like uh, they've been in fighting um, for, for when, you, when you're young, right? Um, fighting and kickboxing and so on. So now you can tie boxing, right? And you went up to the world championships. So the obvious question is, you know, I'm, I hear tenacity. Now, I come from, I wouldn't say I was ever really a fighter. I was training, right, kickboxing and other martial arts. But if I asked you for tenacity, you know, which gifts came out of going the whole way with Thai boxing for a number of years 
do you think helped to contribute to that tenacity? Through Thai boxing uh, alone? Uh, say focus, determination, um, concentration. I had a very difficult time learning to control my emotions. Yeah. Um, and Thai boxing, I, mean, I, I before Thai boxing, I started late in life Thai boxing. I started when I was 33 years old. Uh, and it was actually my second sport. My first sport was uh, soccer, football. Um, and I played professional right out of high school when I was 17, 18 years old. That was my dream, it was to play. So um, I didn't make it. Uh, I mean, I made it for one year, but I didn't, I didn't become. You didn't stay there? Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I wanted to become Beckenbauer like I was hoping to, but. Uh, you stay there. But, but the most important thing for me, what I, what I asked myself, I can remember specifically at the age of 17 was, um, I was living on my own, so those that know, like I was on the streets my, at 16 years old. Uh, my mom was a drug addict, and I was uh, basically fending for myself, so I didn't have anything. I, mean, I came from a good family, but it was like sink or swim. And so I hustled, um, did what I had to do to get to, to Germany. Um, but I, I remember asking myself, if what if I'm one day 50 years old uh, and I don't, and I didn't go for it, I didn't try, I didn't go at least go for it and try out, right? And I couldn't live with myself if I didn't at least go for it, right? Um, <clears throat> then the second thing when I started later in life when I started Thai boxing, um, I didn't start originally to fight. I just started, I went through a transformational uh, training with, um, it, it was like the same work that Tony Robbins went through. Um, uh, it was a different program out of uh, Dallas. And Guy Mesger happened to be my buddy um, in this. And Guy Mesger is one of the first uh, UFC fighters in the 90s, like five times world champion. And he happened to be my buddy, my partner, you have a buddy. And I had a plan that said all the things that you wanted to do in life but never did. And one of them was martial arts. And he's like, well, you have the right partner show up at my gym tomorrow. So I was smoking cigarettes, I was overweight, 30, 40 pounds overweight, um, and I just started training just to get in shape. And then I got a little bit better shape and started getting better, and the next thing was to spar. Um, and I was like, well, the only thing um, holding me back is fear. So I had to walk through my fear, and then, start, and then I had a fight, and then next thing you know, a couple of years later, I was championing. How did you overcome fear? I think everyone has fear. Um, just even Guy Mesger used to tell me that he had 175 something pro fights, and he used to call me before every. I would call him actually before every fight, and um, and he would be like, Rob, every don't tell anyone this, but every time I go into the ring, I have fear, um, and fear is is a normal thing um, to have as a human, right? It's whether, how do we deal with this field? Do, do we let fear? Control our, uh, control our lives. Um, for example, like what's going on with the pandemic and all this other stuff. Am I going to sit at home and watch CNN with a mask on, or I'm going to continue my work and what I need to do, right? Um, and the same thing with fear, walking through that, um, uh, and with support as well. You need, you know, teammates. You need um, trainers. You need um, support in the ecosystem. And one thing that you said earlier about um, Sometimes that's the way life works. Sometimes, sometimes we're down, sometimes we're up, um, but it's our community that, that keeps each other up, right, and supports each other because we're interdependent as humans. Um, this is what we're here is to cohabitate and help each other, really, and a lot of people forget this, I think. You know, what I'm loving about what I'm hearing, right, so I grew up two children's homes, 18 years, from six months of age to 18 years of age, right? I learned things early, much like yourself, what it sounds like. But one of the things which I connected to was being an introvert. So I'm an introverted extrovert. Right now, most of you here are seeing the extroverted side of me, but I'm an introvert too. I love both. I didn't get it early on, but I get it now because it gives me uh, a way to pierce the veil of people's shit, to get into who they really are and to release it, right? Okay, so you as a kid, at 16, I get what happened, but you as a kid, like, how would you describe yourself as a child through the, through the filter of what I've just said? And how did it hinder you if it did? And then how did it help you if it did? As a child? Yeah. Um, 
which aspect uh, I had major problems as a child um, in school and what, what kind of problems did you have? Um, dis I was dyslexic. Um, I had what they called a attention deficit deficit disorder. I didn't know. Um, I had uh, I guess growing up I thought that I had. Um, that I wasn't very intelligent, I thought, because my attention was somewhere else. And then, um, so I had major problems. I was fighting all the time in school. I was fighting way before. <laughs> fighting before fighting. The art of fighting before fighting. No, but actually, if, uh, what I learned from that with my children, when I have children, is, is one of the things is I'll have them study martial arts. Because if I would have learned to control my temper and my emotions at an early age, I would have had a different story. But I didn't. I ruined a lot of things with my my uh, temper and so forth, my emotions at, at a young age, um, so many things, and because um, uh, I wasn't able to control my my, my emotions. Yeah. So then, growing up as a kid, as you mentioned, you know, these problems, ADD, da 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 da, and so in a way, they could have hindered you because, as you said, I was always fighting, I was always in trouble, I wasn't able to focus, maybe I thought I was dumb, uh, all these things that weren't true, right? Okay, so then how did those things, probably through martial arts, but how did they then from hinder to help? How, do, how, do, how do you think that's happened? Great question. I think it's uh, it's really all about like alchemizing, taking the darkness to the light, right? Um, these things that turn out to be, um, well, I, th I thought at the time were, uh, let's say, disabilities or whatever you want to call them, actually turned out to be my greatest assets. Um, because of the way I think now, the way we're able to come up with the stuff that we come up with is because we think differently, right? And I think there's a lot of people here in the room that are innovators that similar type story um, that were maybe cast out because this, the old industrial age systems um, are taught to be worker bees and not uh, um, actually entrepreneurs or not how to think outside the box. And so um, um, thank goodness for all the people that, uh, that think differently. Yeah. You know, now, I want to get on to what you're doing now, but one last question remains. You know, how, if someone's here watching now saying, okay, I know where you've come from. I know that, <laughs> that, that you are, if we're in London, I'll call you a rude boy. <laughs> rude boy! <laughs> For those who understand Patois, there's one here, Hassan, he's like, yeah, I get you. <laughs> rude boy! Right, so, so if you're in London, that's what we'll call you, right? Um, so you've come through that, uh, through martial arts, you've learned how to harness and focus. You have tenacity, which keeps you driving forward, right? And then you began to, um, the darkest elements of you, you began to embrace. And as many people here probably, possibly, you know, have these dark elements to us, yet a lot of the time we push them away. We disown them. But that's powerlessness. Powerfulness comes when we embrace them, right, as you've done. And guess what happens? Well, we'll get onto that in a second. So. If I would ask you then, for people here who are wondering, how do I go, you know, from this mentality of, you know, worker bee, get a good job, nine to five, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, by the way, and anyone here is working nine to five, get a good job, it's all good, but from the point of view of, like, how do you make the transition from that to perhaps thinking differently, which I think is crucial? Well, that's a broad question, but I think surrounding ourselves with the right people, mm. um, not only the right type of minds, the right type of collaboration, or, you know, um, being able to, in, in alignment, right, the mastermind principle is whenever two, more, two or more minds align in harmony, right, mm. not conflicting, not debating, not polarization, not um, all these other things that people say about critical thinking, right, um, which is taught in schools. But how do they teach possibility thinking, how to, right, how to do something. There's always a way yeah. to do something. And for me, the current systems have been meant to, like, separate, divide, polarize, black, white, um, different religions, all these different things, which to me is, is 
like it's a really archaic way of uh, thinking, a way of um, socializing, a way of obviously it doesn't work that well um, <laughs> based on based on results. Um, and I think more and more people are starting to realize this. Um, thank thank goodness, you know, and 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 surrounding myself around with with the people that I don't have to convince. Um, people that are stuck in, a, say, a certain way, they're not ready to receive, they're not ready, um, how do I put my energy, where do I spend my energy, is it spend its energy to someone, help someone who actually wants help yeah. and is willing to receive it, or waste of, if someone is not ready to receive something, you can't um, force them to, to, to receive, right, so um, just... I would say um, just an ongoing process. There's no recipe um, per se. It's just being able to adapt and uh, this ongoing uh, working type learning, mm. um, constantly learning. I learn from the, the people that I mentor as well. They mentor me uh, as well. So it's just an ongoing and, and giving back. Most importantly, um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for entrepreneurs that taught me, people that mentored me, um, and in turn I, I reciprocate that and give it back um, as well. You know, from what it sounds like, this word collaboration is very powerful for you, as it is for most of the guys here, I believe, because everybody pretty much here got here through someone else, so it's a collaborative e effort, and that's what I love, that's partly at the core of what I do. It's about how do you bring people together, unity and diversity, you know, binika, tungul ika, like that's why we're here, right? In Indonesia, the motto of the country is unity and diversity, so it's no coincidence or accident that we're here, right? So moving on to investing, as, as I know some people here will be like, how do you invest? I want to know, right? So if, can we got an idea of your background? thinking differently. So if you were to, to say to someone who asked you, how do I become a great investor? If there were three things that you could tell them, what would those three things be? Number one is access. Um, if you don't have access to the right information, access to the right opportunities, um, this is where um, most of the the, especially in regards to crypto, um, it's been able to have the relationships and the access to different deals that most people don't give access to. That's one thing that we do is we give access, VC access to the average person, non-VC per se. Um, the other thing is, um, say access, um, knowledge about the, basically the market and um, what's going on economically, different markets, um, overall basic understanding of, of, depends on what you're investing in, but for example, if it's real estate, then you have to know, um, for example, the market, the real estate, all the different um, things that are going on within this, this, this certain area. Uh, if it's crypto, then there's there's all types of different rabbit holes to go down in regards to that. Um, if you're talking about, you know, what type of, I mean, it's a whole different can of worms in itself. Um, so I really say, and now more, more what I see today, uh, investing is based on relationships and trust, uh, especially when it comes to like cryptocurrency. Um, it, there's so many different aspects of new industries and there's no, let's say, per se, fundamentals of cryptocurrency, let's say, uh, per se, and, and a lot of people invest based on trust yeah. and based on relationships. For example, let's say this VC invest or let's say Goldfinger invest in a project because um, things move really, really fast. Um, so those are a couple of the things I would say. And there's one, there's one question, I promise to talk about investing, but there's one question nagging in my head. So if I asked you, so Rob, we've got a, a snapshot of your past. So if I asked you, right, so what is it in your past that is responsible for what you're doing now in your present and the future? What would you say that is, if there's a connection? My spirituality. Ooh. Let's go deeper. Uh, everything uh, based on what I have now is just simple blessings from um, higher power. So, yeah, so, so there's a few guys here who can relate. So there's a story there. We might go into that later. So, okay, so spirituality for some people means one thing. For other people means something else. So there's two questions which I'll bring together. So number one, what do you mean by spirituality and how did you find it? 
Yeah, and the second part of that is to explain this beautiful top that you're wearing, because I know that has something to do with it. So first question, what is spirituality to you, and how did you find it? And the next question is, uh, does it relate to this shirt top that, top that you're wearing? Because it's cool, right? Is it not cool? That was warm. Is this cool? Last time. Is this cool? Yeah. All right. Well, some, some people agree. Some clearly don't. There's one guy in the back going like, Rob, listen, man, that ain't cool. Don't call my name, but that ain't cool, man. <laughs> I won't call your name, Hassani. I'm joking. All right. So I've given you enough time to think about it. Go for it. So my, I'd say my biggest spiritual, well, I've had many throughout the years, but um, in, in 1996, I got sober from drugs and alcohol. Um, I OD'd two times uh, when I was in my early 20s, uh, crossed over, um, came back. That wasn't enough um, for me. And so I've had many bush burning type experiences. And then in 1996, I got sober. Uh, it's the last time I drank alcohol or did uh, hard drugs. Um, so, and it was from a spiritual um, cleaning from a higher, from my belief in a higher power. Um, yeah. You know what I'm going to ask you, because Speak Up Monday is about going deep. And firstly, I appreciate you revealing that, right? Thank you. Um, the real beauty about what we do is being able to go to a vulnerable place and share it with others because even though everyone here looks good, smells good, some people look really good, <laughs> right? And probably smell as good as well. But behind the facade, there are people here struggling, right? Big time. But they'll never tell you. So through you relaying, you know, like how it was for you, in a way gives them permission to step into their greatness. So we all have the seed, it's like an oak tree, right? The seed of a magnificent oak tree is like this big, maybe it's bigger, but that little seed contains all of the intelligence to create a majestic oak tree, right? But for that oak tree to become that, it needs to be put, placed in fertile soil with the conditions around it for it to grow. And through us talking about this stuff, it gives people permission to find their own piece of fertile soil to plant themselves in to allow themselves to grow. So then when I ask you, and I thank you for sharing it, can you go a bit deeper into what that spiritual experience was for you? Well, sure. Um, I'd had numerous type what do they call it when you when you have a let's say a bottom and yeah. we're using alcohol or drugs right my i've had near death bottoms like i mentioned um and but the last time uh, when i got sober in 1996 it wasn't everything on the outside was um was fine if you looked at me from the outside i had money i was doing well i was doing um, I mean, I was making money from illegal means, but um, but <laughs> highly <laughs> functional, but highly <laughs> functional. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, but I realized I had a moment of clarity that um, things, if I kept going down the right that the wrong path, that um, things were were going to happen that were not uh, good. And um, so I, I just really surrendered and and um, uh, gave up and tried something different. And um, and then I had to do a lot of work. I dug myself, I self-destructed, I dug myself in a very deep hole, yeah. and it took me a long period of time to uh, climb out of it. Uh, years, actually. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that, brother. Appreciate it, man. The top, the shirt, where is it? what's the significance? I know there's one behind it. Oh, my friend, um, Tsunami in, uh, in Dubai, gave me this uh, as a gift, and he went to Egypt, uh, a very spiritual person, and he gave me uh, this recently in, uh, in Dubai as a, as a gift. Well, it's a beautiful piece, brother. Like, it, it has something that you feel, you know? Really cool, really cool. Okay, so what we'll do now, there's some people here who may have questions, which we'll get to. So if you have a question in about five or 10 minutes, we'll be ready for your question, right? So think about it in your mind, write it down on the back of a, back of a sheet of paper, tell your friend, Remember the question. Okay, so now this mutual great friend of ours, Gil Peterson, you know, I know you guys are working together, and Gil is a way, if you don't know, it's a way that we actually met. 
and, and we actually met um, during a ceremonial cremation of the King of Kings. And this is a great friend of ours called Erwan. His father passed away recently, and I was hosting this incredible event, which went for 11 hours, right? But I felt energized by the whole, by, uh, by the end of it, I was ready for more. I was like, let's go, let's go, let's go. What else, right? Phenomenal experience going deep into the Balinese culture of why cremation is what it is, about how we release the soul from the body so we get back to that cycle of reincarnation and everything that in, in between. So I met you, Noe, Brother Ali, who's behind the camera, you know, on, on that day, and we were dancing, and, and like, you know, we were feeling, what is it? The gamelan got us. The gamelan got us in the heart. So we're there shaking at these, these, these bullet guys, shaking to the gamelan. It was hilarious. And I've seen the footage. I was like, what the heck? But it was so enjoyable. So, so let's get back to Gil. So now, he put us together. So what, if I can ask, and what is he helping you with at the moment? And if someone else is here, how can they contribute to what you're doing? Um, well, thank you. Um, so first off, Gil and I met back from a mutual friend in like May of last year in uh, Evan Class in, in uh, uh, Dubai. And when we first met, um, Gil told me his background, and he helped uh, Tony Robbins scale um, to different countries, and we'd done some of the same work. I immediately connected with him and said we should be working together at some point, and it was a process, uh, vetting and relationship building and trust that happens with any type of relationship building. And then, um, then over, say, a few months ago, we decided to partner and bring Gil on the, on the team as well. Um, and Gil's amazing. It's amazing. So, um, so really, I would just say, really what we're about is just bringing on amazing people um, and more and more of the top people. We have a, a, already a, a very large ecosystem of <coughs> amazing people that have said, let's work together and let's collaborate and let's help each other. Um, all over, we have in-person chapters in 11 international cities. And um, really, we just want to bring um, the right people more and more to, um, to the community and how we can collaborate and help each other. Love it. Love it. And so now, how can other people contribute to you? So there are people watching now. Some are here to learn. And we'll get s some more specific investment questions for those of you going like, yeah, but you guys haven't spoken about investing. I'm an investor. How do I do it? We're getting to you. So <laughs> eventually. So, so yeah. So. You mentioned about, about Gil, that connection. Now, the last question is um, on this topic. How can people here watching, is there anything that you're looking for? Or that if anyone can contribute to you now, how can they do it? Um, thank you. Um, so first off, I mean, we are, um, we are hiring. And we're bringing the right people on right now as well. We're growing really fast, so we're looking for particular project managers um, to come on board. Um, so we're looking for good people, um, number one. We're also looking for uh, ecosystem partners, um, so here in Bali as well. So different groups and networks that we can partner with, um, whether they're different communities, um, different invest investment communities, um, uh, different innovative uh, entrepreneur communities, because um, really what our ecosystem and system is, is a system of ecosystems. Um, and um, we're always looking for more top projects and always more um, investors. It is. Got it. Okay, great. So now, questions. So if you have a question, so Ayub. Oh, is that Guzman? Yeah. So the mic will probably only reach so far because we're used to dealing with people just inside. <laughs> Outside there, the mic might struggle to reach you, but you can probably walk around and ask your question if you need to. So if you have a question, just pop your hand up, all right, and, and we'll get to it. So, okay, so we'll, we'll give the mic over, over here first. So why we do that, so investing, let's get to that so people here who are investors can learn something as well. So you mentioned some three uh, tips or some three qualities which would be great for investors to have. What else do you think is really important for those sitting here or who are watching would be considerably important for them to become great investors? Great investors in private equity and crypto or um, in which aspects? Choose one. So let's, let's do this. So let's go one for crypto, one for private equities, one for real estate. 
So um, in regards to crypto, uh, well, first off, let's see, in, let's see a show of hands in here. Who, who invests in crypto in, in here? Crypto investors, cool. that's about a quarter of people here. Right, more than that. It's like, uh, yeah. Two thirds. Um, okay. And what about in private equity? Who invests in private equity in here? Private equity? Hmm. I didn't know you did. I'll be talking to you afterwards. <laughs> and in real estate? Real estate. Nice. Okay. okay great. great. So, in regards to crypto, um, I mean, I can't say that what's going to make you a great. Um, uh, crypto investor. I mean, first off, I think you have to get, uh, you got to get in, in the right projects, number one. Um, if you're not in the right projects, um, then the chances of success are, um, are less. Um, a lot of the good projects are taken up by VCs or different networks. Um, and one of the things that we do is because we have different VCs and different networks that use our system, we get access to the deals um, that they've already vetted and screened. So we give access um, to our community on that aspect. So um, I would say, number one, if you're not invested in, I mean, it depends on what type of product. <laughs> Crypto is very general. I mean, there's stuff like, for example, liquidity pools or yield farming, which we have those type of products as well, which are weekly returns. For example, our liquidity pool, where it's the only asset backed um, liquidity pool meaning with a surety from institutional grade. Um, so we're able to give about 1.6% uh, weekly, about 7% a month on that type of stuff. Um, that's pretty simple uh, stuff. But then in regards to like crypto projects, altcoins, um, you have to get in on the private sale, obviously, um, and on the good projects. And most of uh, these, like a lot of people that buy crypto, for example, once it's on an exchange, <clears throat> say, for example, if you're buying Solana, well, most people come in and buy Solana once it's 100 or 200x already on the exchange. The way you uh, make money on crypto, or say if you get in the private sale, the pre-sale, like say 50% discount before they go public. Yeah. Um, and once then, then that basically, if it's a good project, the question is if it's if it's 2x, then it's 4x. If you got a 50% discount, if it's 10x, then you made 20x. Mm -hmm. Or if it was something like Solana, and then if you got in a private sale, then you're, you know, with hundreds of millions or billions, right? You're smiling, yeah. So that's crypto. So we've got real estate and private equity. Um, real estate, to be honest with you right now, I'm not invested in real estate myself. Um, uh, it depends on the market. Um, it depends on, and this, especially in, in regards to uh, what's currently going on with the global economic crisis. Um, I think you have to watch the markets um, right now. Being that I invested in subprime crisis before and when that crashed, um, I think personally that the, well, the foreclosures in the U.S. have yet to hit. Um, they're still building up. You have the entire globe, which has um, had at least two quarantines, um, right? So yeah. uh, in the way that the foreclosures happen, it usually takes a couple of years for them to to crash. So I think the worst is yet to come economically. Um, if, if you're maybe investing in a certain uh, particular, there, there are um, certain areas, like for example, my mother, um, just she just sold her place in Austin, Texas, um, because that market's really hot. Uh, Miami's really hot, for example, in the US. Um, I don't know the market that well here, so I can't speak on the market. Um, there are markets that you can uh, make money on, but in particular with me, I'm not really uh, uh, really bullish on real estate at the moment. I think the time to buy is once the market crashes. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> that's when I will buy real estate is once um, the economic crisis hits and it hits rock bottom, then. Private uh, equity. Uh, and then private equity. Private equity is a whole different um, can of worms. Um, it's used, it moves really slow. Um, I'm American, but a lot of Americans still are in, within private equity. Um, it's usually, um, you know, three to seven months really for investors to pull the trigger on private equity. Um, we have a lot of private equity deals um, that come through. Um, I would say right now in private equity, investing in. Uh, early stage seed, um, pre-seed or seed. Um, uh, there's too much risk for me personally. Um, uh, yeah, you can make money in, in crypto early stage, but in private equity, it's with all this stuff going on, I would say coming in and like A round um, deals or more. It depends on the deals per se. Um, and then even secondary, it depends on how much you're investing as well, what type of check sizes. Um, so for example, we have you know secondary market deals um, that are larger 
type deals, but that are, uh, let's say, less risk. For example, like Luminous, which is um, Bill Gates is uh, invested in, which is replacing the silicon chips um, for, and Microsoft is going to use this technology. So like, those type of investment. And these are, once again, it's about access, right? Um, <coughs> these type of deals most people don't have access to, to co-invest with Bill Gates. Right? So. so then, uh, all right, so we're going to go to your question very soon, my brother. Now, if people want to contact you, right, or contact your company, number one, for the recruitment hires you're looking for, number two, to maybe be a project that is investable, how do they do that? What's the process? So first off, if they want to, if they want to contact us, um, we can go on our website, goldfinger.io. There's no E yeah, in yeah, Goldfinger. I, I was about to say that Goldfinger, everyone's jumping on Goldfinger. It's not here. Scam. It's not no a scam. E. There's no E at, at Goldfinger. No E. It's just go straight to the R. Yeah. yeah Goldfinger.io. Dot dot yeah. um, also, our Telegram chat. We have uh, our Telegram community, Twitter. Uh, as well, Goldfinger. Um, so you can message someone, an admin on the Telegram, or also um, connect with us on uh, our uh, Instagram or um, website. Okay. Uh, and it depends on if what you're interested in, what capacity, um, and then someone from our team will reach out and uh, and basically with KYC and interview you. Um, that's another thing we're very big on is bring in credible people incredible projects um, uh, where everyone knows at least the on a level playing field, that the projects have been screened, that um, the people are who they say they are, the investors are KYC, at AML, everything is um, at least on a uh, basic playing field, right? Got it, got it. Okay, so now we'll go to that question over here. Thanks for being patient. Yeah, my name is B, and I combine yoga with entrepreneurial expressions, and as I told you, our vision is to bring yoga into the metaverse and bring mindfulness, or as I prefer to say, heartfulness, out of the mind into the heart, but bring that into the metaverse, into the virtual reality. So that my specific context, but maybe a more general question, which might be more relevant for others as well, how do you combine money and the heart? How do you combine business with integrity? How do you bridge between this efficiency, productivity, return on investment of the mind and this heartfelt connection to meaningful projects and to actually making a difference in this world, which is so urgently needed? So I'm curious about your tips and tricks, how to keep the connection to the heart. Uh, great questions. Uh, multifaceted there. So um, the first part you were saying, um, could you repeat, please? Because it was. First part was specifically just from my context, bringing mindfulness, integrity, yoga, meditation, spirituality into the metaverse. So we're not just building other new shopping malls and addictive gaming platforms and other dysfunctional tendencies of human shadows into this new metaverse, but how can we fill it with heart, with meaning? Um, from my perspective, coming from this yoga meditation background, but can be many other contexts. So maybe that as a first one. If, if any projects you have in your portfolio in the Goldfinger investment um, mastermind context, if there's any branch in that direction. There's actually a project that we've invested in here today. Igor Roy. Uh, hold, hold a second, yeah. So, no, no, no way. Come here, brother. Come here, come here, come here. Mind the light. So, I, so, so, I, so. I know Ralph for seven years. He's like a father figure to me, and now I've become a partner in the company. And, um, yeah, so to answer your question, the way that we do that is by one of the first things that Rob mentioned is staying around great people. And great people usually believe in great stories and no other great people. So we are looking to find more projects that are impactful. And it's just so funny you asked that question because uh, Igor, who we invested into his company, 
he is actually working on a project um, that he de developed, which is decentralizing the way that people learn through VR and AR. Um, people with autism, people that are dyslexic, and actually anyone, because you know the, the fundamental ways of learning in the world right now are just not as effective as it could be. So I wanna, if, if, I, could, if I may, give him a quick minute up here. Go to, for um, it. Yeah, Igor, please. M mind your step, Igor, you got cables, wires, and lights. <laughs> Thanks very much for yeah. mentioning well, welcome, Thanks for that question because I think it's very important to bring uh, people uh, to connect to their bodies. So I think that metaverse is actually does opposite. <laughs> so we need to think beyond the metaverse. Augmented reality, I think that is the way because you're going to have the supportive environment. I, Igor, come, come stand here, man. Sorry which to you. Mind your step. We have the camera here. Yeah. You got it. No, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, just put, put, put it in. Come here. All right. We need some light, right? All right, light. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, the whole concept is to bring the uh, uh, people and our future generations back connected to their bodies through the nutrition, through affirmations, through meditation, through breathing techniques, through uh, cold showers, through ice uh, baths. And uh, metaverse, I think it is just an experiential uh, uh, tool which we will have. We'll have these sort of uh, portals where you go in and then you will be able to experience uh, the most beautiful sunset, uh, on the most expensive yacht, uh, have all of these experiences uh, with people to have uh, events, to explore NFT collections, and to train and to explore the, uh, the training and learning experiences. Beautiful. So here in studio with, with Rob, we are not competing anymore because I used to be coming also from the combat sports. And uh, so we are collaborating. So we are bringing everybody who is on the same frequency to, uh, to work on this uh, life-changing experience for, for us to bring some new, new technologies, new ways for our children, for future generations to use these tools in order to live up to their maximum potential. Thank you. I, 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 I love that, man, because what you're saying there, you go, you know, uh, we lost this light over here. Uh, we've got light back, uh, is collaborate, not compete, right? That's what I drew out of what you said also about the body and connecting to the heart inspired by your great question. And so, love that, love that. So, question behind? Yeah, just use, use, use a mic, brother man. Not because I can't hear you, but because people at home can hear you. So, before you ask your question, when I say to you, before you ask your question, um, if I say to you, collaborate, not compete, what comes up for you? Cooperation. Yep, competition. Got it. Love it. All right, so another question, my brother. Yeah, actually, I was going to um, add to that, if that's all right. M mind, mind that light. Can you, can you change the light? Yeah, thanks, brother. So my name is Bradley. Some of you here know me. The, uh, I'm a friend of both these guys. And I wanted guy. to answer, actually, I wanted to expand to your question. Um, it's super important for people to own their own data and their own identity in the metaverse. Otherwise, you're basically becoming a product, like on every other platform. Like you said, it's a mall or it's like, you know, these other things that are basically harvesting your data. And in the, in the metaverse, it's, it's super dangerous because your biometric data is being commingled with your social graph and everything else. So now, when you, when you interact with something, everything about your response, your heart rate, your, you know, your blood, your, your um, pupil dilation, all these things are, are being correlated. So self-sovereign identity is super important and being able to own your data and choose how and where that data is shared, if at all, uh, you know, it, it, it is the way to actually uh, provision for what you were saying. Uh, and that's something we're, we're discussing at the moment as well. Beautiful. Beautiful. Th th thanks, Brad. Brad, Brad's a Brad that I just met recently, another Englishman. Love him. He's a great guy. Brad, that microphone is, is yeah, you got it, actually. So, Hassani, question from you. So, we'll take a few more questions, and then what we'll do, people can stay back and we'll do some more. Because we like to keep this to about an hour. I'm pretty sure we're over an hour now. Bhavna, how long are we? Oh, 7.20. Woo! Within time, love that. Bhavna, love you. Thank you very much. Okay, Hassani, over to you, brother. Yeah, so, um, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, for the conversation, the flow of the energy, so good. Um, yeah, Rob, 
question for you. I've enjoyed the conversation so far, connecting and talking about all topics like life, spirituality, time, everything. But for the audience, and also for me as well, the question that comes through, we're speaking a lot about investment and money and all this stuff, but the question is, what would you be, what would you be doing? Like, what, what would your path, your dharma, your story be if you couldn't do what you're doing right now? Like, what's the thing you would otherwise would be doing if you was not able to do the thing you're doing right now? Because that can give some perspective on the other sides of your personality and character. Um, if I wasn't doing what I was doing right now, well, my whole life, what I figured out for me, for me to be true to myself and go back to the integrity part of this, and by the way, integrity for me means um, thoughts, actions, words all lining, right? Um, and most people, a lot of, well, not most people, a lot of people will think one thing, say something else, and do something else, right? This is not alignment, right? So for me, to be true to myself, uh, I have to do what I love to do. Um, there's no other option. Um, I can't do something that I do not like to do. I'm literally worthless. Um, I don't function. I've tried it uh, a couple of times to work for, say, in an office. There's something I didn't like doing or I wasn't passionate about. I'm just <clears throat> simply useless. Um, so for me, I just created um, a business of what I love to do. Uh, and that's um, help people travel around the world um, and integrates art, entertainment, social investing, um, and with the right people and share it and, and help each other. So that's, um, I just created what um, is my life. That's it. And figured out how to monetize it. Well, um, alignment is everything. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Hassani. Great question. Question behind you, Brother. Well, next to you and then behind you after that. So we've got about 10 minutes left. For the for the recorded part, and then we can we can go on afterwards if we want to, no problem. So um, over to you, brother. Question, yeah. Rob, you've mentioned you've read hundreds of books, and probably many of them help you to get where you are today. What is that one book that you always return to? To that is almost like your Bible that always helps you get out of uh, maybe some sticky situations that you get back to. Maybe a spiritual book. Or maybe some like that one book that you always return to. Say one book that I always return to, but um, if you say none of the real estate or the just common knowledge books of whether it's economics or law or finance or any of that stuff, I would say it really sticks out um, more the spiritual books. Um, so uh, what comes to mind is. Um, G.I. Gorchev, um, I'm probably s bad pronunciation, my Russian pronunciation, but a um, uh, Russian philosopher called The Fourth Way, and it's a way of um, a modern man of uh, ascetics, of how to ascend consciousness. Um, uh, that's probably that book. Yeah. The Fourth Way by, by G.I. Gorchev. The Fourth Way. Yeah, yeah. N yeah. Now... The, uh, now the question is a book you read every morning. I oh, hope your question. Buddhist, there's a Buddhist book that um, um, a friend of mine. Well, not a friend of mine. I was mentored years ago by uh, um, by a Russian hacker named Roman Vega, and uh, and he gave me a book. Um, it's a Buddhist uh, morning meditation book, and I read that every morning. Um, so he reads you in front of the whole team. What, what a great facilitator. Now, we've got a bit left, but what I want to do, I've never done it before, but what the heck? Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Everybody. Yes, everybody. All right. Well, everyone here has done breath work. We're in Bali. Everyone does breath work in Bali, especially in Changu. So everyone just grab a stretch and just take a deep breath in through the nose. Hold that breath for the count of four, and then gently out through the mouth. Once more, in through the nose for the count of four. And then out slowly for the count of four. And just say thank you. Thank you. All right, sit back down. There you go. <laughs> you know, I just felt the need to do that. I have no idea why. Maybe later on I'll find out. So, another question. Hi, Rob. How are you? Uh, thank you for being here. This talk has been very, very nice. Um, I wanted to ask you, given your life story, right, and where you have came from and where you are today, um, it's actually a multiple question, all right? <laughs> multiple no, bring, parts. Bring that microphone closer to your mouth. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, first, 
what is something that excites you when you wake up in the morning and what is something that doesn't allow you to sleep at night? And the second part of that question is, what would you say was a moment in your life that became sort of like a breakthrough before and after? Could be spiritually, financially, or any, in any kind of you know, way of life. <laughs> Great question, brother. So two parts to that question. Number one, yes, when you wake up in the morning, what? Uh, what excites you? What excites you? What doesn't let you sleep at night? And what doesn't let you sleep at night? Love it. Thank you, brother. Um, what excites me? I, I love what I do. And I love creating, and I love uh, my team, the people I work with, and I love everything that I do. So every morning I wake up, and I'm ready to go. And the same thing at night. I don't go to sleep um, until I finish what I, everything I need to finish for the day. It could be 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 2 a.m., whatever, 8 a.m., uh, <laughs> but whatever. And whatever I feel that I put it all on the table at the end of the day um, in regards to what we're working on. Um, that's the first step. Beautiful. Maya, question, yeah. Now, make, make this question short, by the way. We haven't got long, so no, no two-minute lead-ins. Just All right, go straight Robert. to it. You're eating up my time. So the question that I, I wanted that. to ask. Arrives late and does that. I love you, Maya. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, in the, in the long term, in, in 10 years, cause, about Goldfinger, because I see you guys building a massive network. Country after country that you touch, you build a massive network of philanthropists and entrepreneurs. What is the biggest vision that you see Goldfinger accomplishing with this network directed towards philanthropy and helping humanity. I would love to know what Goldfinger is the biggest goal um, with this platform. Amazing. Great question, Sister Maya. Great question. So let me, I'll just dive down into that a little bit more. <clears throat> so first off, um, let's just call them what I call 2.0 and 3.0 to simplify things. Um, systems and paradigms. So what happens in, in the past is people try to innovate and create in, in a 2.0 paradigm. For example, Silicon Valley, right? And San Francisco, you have the same typical A, B, C, I call them alphabet rounds. Hopefully one day they'll monetize. One day they'll have an actual business model. Um, and this is how most of Silicon Valley startups work and this is how the whole industry works. And people want to innovate inside this paradigm. But we're also talking about a paradigm that's zero sum game, okay? win, lose, win, lose, 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 very few win, win, right? So most people try to innovate and then create a system that creates a new paradigm. We actually did the opposite. We actually created a new paradigm, right? First, based on game theory and tested all this stuff and worked it out where it actually checks mathematically and scientifically um, into this paradigm where everyone is actually incentivized to actually help each other, share resources, right? and give and act, let people access their network and monetize their network. <clears throat> this is what we've done already. It's already like figured out scientifically and mathematically. And now we're building the new systems for this. And so to answer your question, in the next 10 years, we've actually created a framework that allows everyone to own their own data, everyone to own, have their own systems um, that can bridge into this ecosystem of systems uh, and a whole framework of game theory and technology that um, allows people to operate in this whole new paradigm. Um, and that's, um, I had a family office guy tell me about a year and a half ago, and he said, Rob, do you understand um, what you guys have created? And I said, yeah, he goes, I don't think you, you do. And I said, no, I, I totally understand. And he's like, if, if Facebook had this type of um, what you guys are building and, and what it does to humanity and, and, and the planet, um, it would be a different planet. And I said, exactly, that's why we created it. So um, and that's, what we're, that's what we're doing. So, um, and yeah, the thing is that it works. It's my, it's my and philanthropically, um, I've done, I've helped people for many, many years in different ways. I've helped hundreds, if not thousands of alcoholics get sober. Ooh. I've had, um, I've had a foundation for children. There's different ways which you can give. There's different, you can teach. There's so many different ways, right? Uh, this is my gift in a bigger, in a macro way. Um, uh, so I'm not necessarily drilling down per se in that aspect, but creating a bigger framework which allows other people to, think about Burning Man, right? Burning Man is a big, really big, uh, I don't know, who in here is a burner? Anyone go to Burning Man? 
Perfect. So when you go to Burning Man, you can basically do whatever you want to do, right? And it's, it's, it's this huge game that, that works. Um, that's what we did is create a Burning Man technology. Um, you can do whatever you want, um, basically, as long as you're coming from the right place <coughs> and um, inside these systems. Love that. So look, guys, um, one more question. Sister Bhavna will do you now. This is what, as you come forward, darling, I think the microphone might not reach that far. So this is what we're going to do, right? So about maybe three or four weeks ago, I made a commitment, right? Because we used to do Speak Up Monday. It goes on for two hours. <laughs> people still stayed, but people kept telling me, Rob, man, <laughs> two hours too long, <laughs> right? I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> we're just getting started. But, uh, but anyway, so I made a commitment. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll shoot it for an hour tops, right? And that's it. So we're coming up to the hour. So we have one more question from, from Bhavna. Then what we'll do is that we'll, we'll cut it there. But if you want to stay behind, Rob, are you okay to stay for a little bit? Yeah, I can stay a little bit. By the way, we're having a big uh, event on Thursday night. At our uh, villa in Abud, everyone's invited. And, uh, All right, so so we'll tomorrow too. We have another tomorrow, event tomorrow uh, so which is Angel's birthday. Tomorrow. So we'll give you a chance to plug that. So what we're going to do is that we have one more question. We'll we'll end the show there, but we will stay behind and still take questions. So nothing changes effectively except we switch one of the ca two of the cameras off. Uh, and if you want to stay, you're more than welcome. Um, what I would do though um, is so Ayub, can you hold up that? Um, the QR code again. Yeah, just hold, hold, hold it up, hold it up. Yeah, so what Ayub's got in his hand, this is the QR code, right? So if you want to be part of this group, we have a one-way bulletin. That's, I think, our second or third group. Um, so just QR and join the group. Easiest way to do it, keep in touch with what we're doing. Next week, thank you, my brother, it'll be over there next to where the water is, sort of was, looks like it's done. Anyway, over there. <laughs> so next week, our sister Bhavna, who's about to ask this question, who's a beautiful human being as well, right? Next week, she'll be interviewing Joe Tandle, who's another incredible guy. And Joe is, uh, has an incredible background in community creation. Uh, he was in, you know, at, 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 it was also working with Burning Man in New York, actually, and a whole ton of other stuff. So he's doing a festival called Bali Bloom, which I think will be its third one officially, um, but I think two were unofficial. <laughs> so that was coming up soon in early May, Bali Bloom Festival, right? And again, great guy. So Bhavna will be interviewing him here next week. So this is working towards episode 300. And yes, six o'clock, come for a bit of pre-networking, grab some food. 6.30, we get started, right? And this is live on Instagram Live, YouTube Live, and what's the other one? It's gonna Facebook Live, right? Join the group so you can find out more. Okay, we'll go to Bhavna's question. Then Rob, what we do is that um, have a think. I'll ask you again in case you forget. Have a think of what it is you'd like to leave people with. Could be a word of wisdom. Could be reiterating something you've said already. Or it could be something completely new that just jumps in your head like, I've got to tell them about this. And plug, plug your event if you want. That's fine too. And then, but we'll hear from Bhavna first. And then after that, we'll do our thing. So Bhavna, over to you, darling. It's on. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, I just loved that you as a leader brought in members of your team to answer some of the questions. So this question is going to be a bit quirky, but also a bit of a pivot on how I typically ask it. So if Goldfinger were a bottle that you could bottle it up and sell it in the supermarket, stores, wherever, what would the top three ingredients be? And not necessarily, not spices, not flavor profiles, but traits, which I know you've touched on throughout the conversation, but I'd love for it to be the top three ingredients if we could buy Goldfinger and you could sell it. Um, absolutely. And then that's what, what people, are at, the, at the end of the day, what we found people are f most focused on, which is capital, intellectual, human, real capital, deals. If you have capital, where are you putting your money? R ROI, return on, uh, uh, return on impact, uh, and connections. Three things, deals, capital, connections. And if people could buy Rob Charles and sell it? Not for sale. <laughs> Many people have tried. I don't sell oh. Oh, man, you know, like, talk about poignant moments, right? In every interview, there's a poignant moment. There have been several this time, but that one kind of hangs with me. I ain't for sale. Praise uh, the Lord. I've had multiple uh, 
people try to buy yeah. through the years, and, and it's not uh, it's not a, it's not about money for me. Turn down billionaires, multi billionaires. We've got a, a got Noah as one of the team here. So uh, as we um, come to uh, fulfill the commitment I made, one one hour only. Um, there's two things. So one, feel free to plug the events that you're going to be doing in Ubud. Uh, and then what we want to hear from you is uh, some words of, I call them words of wisdom, but it's whatever you feel in your heart to say is actually what it really is, right? And yeah, you can go now. Um, and the question, just words of uh, to... Yeah, so, so, like, so we've had about an hour together. People have found out about your background, about where you're from, what's in your heart, what drives you, right? Tenacity, you know, where that came from, some of those life experiences, some of those defining moments, which you asked, great question. Uh, Maya asked, you know, like, where is Goldfinger going? Which is a question I was going to ask. I'm glad you beat me to it. Um, we've got the, the essence of you, which permeates what you do, right? The two are connected inextricably. So now what we're saying is that if you want to leave someone, maybe watching here or watching at home, you know, like what is in your heart to share with them as a parting word to those who are viewing remotely and then we'll continue afterwards. I would say um, from my own experience is just to give unconditionally and just keep giving, giving, giving um, and don't expect anything in return. Uh, and But most importantly, to the right people that are ready to receive. Yeah. Love it, love it. And now feel free to plug those two events which Ali was talking about, yeah? Two events. Oh, two events, so we have uh, an event tomorrow night. Ali, what time is it tomorrow night? From 6 p.m. <laughs> From 6 p.m. Uh, was that? Till 4 a.m. Okay, that's off the record. Uh, <laughs> 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Uh, at uh, in Abud, we have a villa there, a Joy Boutique villa, uh, and then um, uh, Thursday night. I have to get back on the time on that, but we'll have another event um, on Thursday. Yeah. Cool. So look, guys, let's do um, a round of, before you do it, so I'll ask you to do a round of applause and we'll, we'll officially sign off. But as I mentioned before, we're going to go more, right? But we're just going to switch off some of these cameras here. And uh, yeah, you're welcome to stay. We'll keep Rob for a bit longer, ask some of your questions that, that you may have, all right? So everybody, round of applause for our guest, Rob Charles. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so Speak Up Monday, we can close it out there. Good Guzman. Yeah, done. Now, the unofficial X-rated side of the evening. I'm joking.